thank you, Liam. Uh, thank you all for being here, or I guess uh, thank you for requiring them uh, all to be here. <laughs> so, altruism. Let's talk about altruism first, and then we'll talk about is there an alternative to altruism? Because there's probably no concept in the world today more accepted, more viewed positively, more just you know, acknowledge as this is morality, this is what ethics means, than altruism. Altruism is ethics. It is being good, being just, being right. Now, I'm going to argue that nobody actually lives it. Nobody actually practices it, not consistently, because you can't, let's be honest. But we all know it's right, it's just, it's good. We live our lives, we know it's right, we don't quite practice it, we feel a little guilty. Maybe you're too young to feel guilty, but your parents feel guilty, your grandparents feel guilty. And I think it's good to question these ideas. So what is altruism? What do we mean when we say altruism? Now, a lot of people, a lot of people think that altruism means, you know, being nice to people, like opening a door if somebody's walking by who's older than you or is struggling getting up in the bus for somebody older than you or, or just helping out somebody who's in trouble or in need on occasion. But, you know, you, you are studying an institution that has this as one of your moral virtues. What, what is altruism? Is that what it is? Just being nice? No, right? What, so what is it? What is it? Putting others in front of yourself. Yeah, putting others in front of yourself. Putting the well-being, happiness of other people ahead of your own. Always. As a moral commandment, as a moral virtue, as a moral necessity. The concept of altruism was actually coined by a French philosopher in the 19th century. I mean, it exists way back, certainly in Christianity's history, altruism is a key feature. But as a term, as a word, it was coined by Augustine Comte, C-O-M-T-E, in the 19th century. He was a philosopher. And Comte says, to be a good person, to be just, to be moral, to be virtuous, to be noble, means to live for the sake of other people. Always. Put the interests of other people before your own. Indeed, never think of yourself. Like if you if you help somebody and you and you think I'm going to help this person because it's going to make me feel good. Uh uh, it doesn't count. You get negative points. It doesn't count as altruism because your motivation was feeling good, which is you, which is being selfish, which is about yourself. And the whole point of altruism is never think about yourself. Always think about others. Act in everything that you do for the well-being of other people. And who are these others? Well, the others should be the people who really need help. The people who don't have. The more needy they are, the more they deserve your help, your altruism your thought, your focus. And it's almost unquestioned in the world we live in that this is good and noble and right. So, Ayn Rand asks a very simple question. She asks a simple question, and the question is, why? Why should I live for other people? Why is their life more important than my life? I'll make an assumption that we only live once. This life is it. There's nothing afterwards. You don't get reincarnated. Just once. Why should I live in this one shot I have at life? This one time on planet Earth. Why should I live for other people? What about me? And if I'm supposed to live for other people, what are they supposed to live for? Other people. And what are they supposed to live for? Other people. And where does it end? And the more needy, the more needy, we 
you said everything to the needy. What are they supposed to do? To be moral people. They should turn around and find somebody even more needy than them and live for them. So logically, it's like an infinite loop. And what's the point? And nobody can actually be happy because once you're happy, uh-oh, that's not good. You're not sacrificing enough. You're not helping other people enough. You're not giving enough. You actually be happy. That's pretty self-interested. So Ayn Rand challenges all of us. And I, I saw in the library you have some Ayn Rand books, and I'm, I'm um, you know, it changed my life. I think it changed uh, Liam's life. It's changed Jeremy's life. It's, it's these are powerful books. I recommend them, even if you disagree, because they will challenge everything you believe in. That'll make you a better thinker, because you'll be able to stand up for what you believe in. So always read people you disagree with. If you just read the stuff you agree with, you're just, you're just stuck. You'll go nowhere. You won't improve your own thinking. So I may ask you, why should I sacrifice my life? Why should I live for other people? We've got one life. And every one of us, every one of us, every human being on the planet is challenged because we're a unique species. We're a unique species. We're very different than any other animal out there. Because other animals know how to live. It's, it's just instinctual. They've got the DNA that tells them exactly what they need to do in order to survive. Exactly what they need to do in order to live successfully. There is no morality for animals. Why? Because it's programmed. We are not programmed. At least not in that detail. We actually make choices. We have free will. We have the ability to choose right versus wrong. What we will do, what we won't do. We can actually, as a species, as individuals, we can commit suicide. We can choose to die. It's very, very unusual in nature. So all of us face fundamentally this situation of how do we live? When you're born, you're not born with the tools, the intellectual tools, to be able to actually figure out what's good for you and what's bad for you, what's right and what's wrong. You learn that from your parents. You figure it out by yourself. Hopefully, about your age, you rebel. Rebellion is good. You don't believe your parents anymore. You don't believe your teachers anymore. This is good. This is the, this is the, 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 the hormones kicking in and making you an independent thinker, forcing you to be an independent thinker. It's good not to believe, not to agree. I mean, they might be right. And ultimately, you should figure out if they're right or wrong. But this is about the age where you should be challenging everything. You should be questioning everything. Because they might be wrong. People can be wrong. That's the thing about human beings. We're not animals. Animals can't be wrong. I mean, they can be, they get eaten, right? <laughs> but they have no choice. They are programmed to behave in particular ways. So they either choose and make a bad mistake, or choose something that's evil or bad. They're just programmed to be that. So human beings are unique in that we have to choose to live. And yet we don't know how to. So we have to figure out how to live. A lot of you are going to figure it out right now. Not right now, but generally. Well, what do you want to do with the, rest of, with the rest of your life? Right? You may be graduating in a year or two, or maybe in a few months. And you're trying to figure out what am I going to study? Where am I going to go to school? What do I want to do with my life? It's hard. It's damn hard. And there are no easy answers. And your responsibility to yourself is to figure that out that choice. Everything in life, in a sense, is like that. You can't take anything for granted. You have to choose how to live and what life means to you. So, there's a fundamental choice that human beings have between how, basically of how to live. Once you choose to live, and all of us, almost all of us, choose to live, then the question is how? What do we do to live? What actions must we take in order to be successful at this thing called life? 
And this is what Ayurveda encourages us to do. It's your responsibility, each one of you, to live, to be alive. In that sense, every one of you should be self-interested. You need to focus on what's it going to take for me to live. And what does it take for human beings to live? You know, animals have different values, if you will. You know, values are things that we want to gain, act to gain or keep, things that we, we want. They could be spiritual values, like honesty, but we want to be honest. We, we need to act in order to be honest. Or they could be material things, like a nice computer. But values are things that we act to gain or keep. Right? And the most important values are moral values. So what's the thing that makes us human, the thing that's most important to us as human beings if we want to survive? Like, how do human beings survive? Like a plant. A plant's values are easy. What are the plant's values? Any plant. It doesn't actually choose them. Nature has chosen them for it. And what are plant's values? Yell them out. What's Sunlight. Sunlight. So if you put a plant in the shade, what does it do? It kind of wiggles its way and tries to find the sunlight. Right? And it goes to where the sunlight is. What else is a value? Musical accompaniment? <laughs> what else is a value? Water, right? So you put it in a dry soil and the roots go out and they're looking for the water. It's acting to find its values, to find the things that are necessary for it in order to survive. Animals are the same thing. A cheetah's value is speed and agility. A lion is strength. What is a human being? What, what is it that makes it possible for us to survive, just to survive? What's that? Fulfilling our base necessities. But how do we fulfill our base necessities? Our intelligence. What's that? Our intelligence. Our intelligence. Right? It's using our minds. So think about how many people here have the gene for agriculture. You, you, it's just programmed within you to know exactly how to do agriculture. Like to, to get food. And I know that probably some, you know, some of your parents might be farmers. But that doesn't give you the gene for agriculture, does it? My dad's a doctor, I don't have a gene for medicine. How do we do agriculture? I mean, we have, what, 8 billion people on the planet? Everybody gets fed? I mean, some people not so well, but mostly everybody gets fed. How do we do that? Right? Do, do we just know how to do it like a plant just sends its roots out? Do we just know how to do it like a cheetah that just hunts and finds its prey? We learnt it. And before we can learn it, what has to happen? Well, who do you learn from? We learn, we observe nature. We observe nature, and then what do we do? And then we copy it. Then we copy it. So, do we really copy nature? So, any skyscrapers in nature? <laughs> we learn, we observe, you're right, we observe nature. We learn to understand nature. We learn the rules, the laws, the physics, the biology, the chemistry of nature. And then we reshape nature to fit our needs. And that's all by using our mind. That's all by using our reason. So think about agriculture. At some point, some genius, Einstein of his day, knows that if you drop a seed on the ground and you water it, a plant grows from it. Now, that's obvious to every three-year-old today, because we teach it, right? But for 100,000 years, human beings didn't know that that happened. They thought, trees just, you know, plants just show up. There's no cause. The God is to it. The God of trees, I don't know. I'm sure there was a God of trees at some point. There was a God of rivers. There's a God of the sky. There's a God of the moon. God of the sun. Because everything we didn't understand was a God. But then we discovered science, slowly, little bits. So the seed is dropped, and a plant grows. And he made that discovery. And what did we do to this guy, probably, or okay, gal? What did we do to them? What do we usually do to people who 
discover new things. And in history, not today, but in history, what did we do to people discover new things and challenge the status quo? Yeah, we'll probably crucify them or burn them at the stake or something nice like that. Right? We don't admire it. Unfortunately, in human history, we have not respected the great achievers, the great geniuses. But then, it probably took 10,000 years before that scientific discovery was then turned into what we call agriculture. It probably took an entrepreneur like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs who said, hey, wait a minute, if that's true, if that science is true, we can do this on a mass scale. We can get seeds and we can sow the seeds and do whatever they do in agriculture, because I don't know, um, you know, in order to grow stuff. And then we can feed more people. And about 10,000 years ago, we had an agricultural rev revolution because some really, really smart people used their mind to reshape nature to fit human needs. And we had massive amounts of food suddenly, and the population started growing and we congregated into cities and created civilizations. After 100,000 years of being human, we finally discovered agriculture. All the product of the human mind. All the product of the human brain. And it turns out that if you free the human mind, if you let people think for themselves, if you let people discover, if you give them the opportunity to go out there and figure stuff out without an authority telling them what they can and cannot think, what they can and cannot do, without getting permission from a king or a council or a state, then beautiful things happen. People find ways to improve our survival as human beings. If you look at those hundred years, for a hundred years, we made nothing. We hunted, we collected stuff. Then we had a little bit of an agricultural revolution, so things got a little bit better, but not much. Still, life expectancy for the most part, up until about 200 years ago, was what? What was life expectancy? 50. 50. 50 was like ancient. <laughs> life expectancy was under 40. Most country, most places around the world, life expectancy was in the 30s, whether low 30s or high 30s, depended. But it's somewhere in between, so I, I'm long dead. You guys are approaching middle age. Right? I mean, life's pretty sweet. You guys are going to live to be 100 easily. Maybe quite a bit more if biotech advances. So there was a whole period in which we lived to be 35, let's say. We had about $2 a day. That's average income. Not average income. That is income for 98% of the population. Up until about 200 years ago, two dollars a day. We were farmers. We planted food and we ate it. That was it. No leftovers. No trading. No vacations. No restaurants. No iPhones. I don't know how we lived. <laughs> you know, I I lived before the era of iPhones, so I can vaguely remember what life was like. <laughs> so for 200, for 10,000, years, it was like that, and then suddenly it went like this. Through the roof. We're so rich today, we don't know how rich we are. Because we have no way to measure it. How do you measure the value of electricity? I mean, we pay a little bit for it, but that's not a measure of the value it has for us in our lives. How do you measure the value of running water? Toilets. Video. I mean, the, the value is unbelievable. Our quality of life, our standard of living, is millions of times greater than our ancestors from about 200 years ago. All of that happened like this, all because of one thing. We suddenly said to people, we suddenly tell people, and you can ask me why in the community, we said to people, you can think for yourself. We're not going to question it. We're not going to challenge it. You don't need permission. You don't need permission. You can invent what you want. You can do science and discover what you want. We won't question it. Well, we won't question it, but we won't, we won't stop you from doing it. We gave them freedom. And freedom of the mind more than anything else, of individuals using their mind in pursuit of knowledge, in pursuit of life. So reason, we now know without question, is the way in which we make our life better as individuals. It's using our rational mind to figure out what's good, what's bad, what will work, what doesn't work, what's true, what's false. There's no other mechanism. There's no revelation. There's no other dimension in which the truth exists. The truth is right here. Reality is what it is. 
And we can figure it out using our minds. So for Iran, life is about using your reason to guide your life towards making it better, making your life better for you. And the purpose of your life should be not service to others, not sacrifice, not suffering, but your own happiness, your own happiness, your own success, your own flourishing as a human being, living the best life you can live as a human being with everything that entails. Primarily what it entails is using your mind, using your reason to guide you because it's all we have. We're not automatons. We're not programmed. Nature hasn't given us the programming to help us survive and to achieve happiness. What we have is our own mind. So, Rand's argument is, why should I live other people? I have one life on this earth. It's my life. I have the tool to make it possible for me to live well. That is human reason. And now it's just a question of applying that tool to every aspect of my life. And morality, ethics, should be, she says. <laughs> the study... Is that Bach? <laughs> ethics, morality, which conventionally just says, live for other people, sacrifice, do what's good for them. She says, no, no. What morality should be is to figure out, to figure out, to give us guidance, to give us principles, to give us the knowledge of how to live the best life that we can for ourselves. Because it's not obvious, again, we're not born with that knowledge. We don't know how to do it. And Aristotle, if, if you know a little bit about Greek philosophy, Aristotle was kind of the first one who embarked on this kind of project. His question was not, with study ethics, what can I do to help other people? How do we sacrifice? I mean, he would have never thought of that. That, would, that, is, a, that is a bizarre question for Greek philosophy. Greek philosophers all thought, huh, how do we make individual life, human life better? How do we make human beings live a better life? And Aristotle's project is, how do, what are the things, called the virtues, what are the virtues, what are the actions human beings need to take to make their life good, to prosper, to flourish? In, in Greek, and I, this is, if you know Greek, then I apologize in advance because I'm going to brutalize the word. Eudaimonia, you know, which was this concept in Greece of happiness, fulfillment, flourishing as an individual. What are the things, what are the principles I need to engage in life? in order to achieve your demand? What are the principles I need to engage in life in order to achieve my own personal happiness, my own personal fulfillment, the best possible life for me as an individual? And that should be what ethics teaches us. That should be what ethics studies. It should be a science. The science of human well-being. The science of loss. And what is good for each one of us as a human being? We're all the same in important ways. We all rely, for example, on reason in order to be successful. But what does reason demand from us? What does it mean to live by reason? Well, it demands certain virtues. It requires certain, and a certain approach to life, a virtuous approach to life. But what are those virtues? They're going to be very different than the virtues necessary to sacrifice. That much more complicated because they're about figuring out how to live, how to live well. So, for example, what does it mean to live a life of reason? Well, it means that I'm going to make a decision based on facts, based on evidence, based on reality, based on what's actually out there. Emotions are important. We all have them. Hopefully, you enjoy them. Sometimes, they're horrible. But what are emotions? What are emotions? Where do they come from? Mystical force. Makes you fall in love. Makes you hate somebody. Makes you depressed. Makes 
be happy. Where do they come from? They just happen? What's that? A brain. It's just chemistry. Just chemistry, right? So it's random. It's whatever the quarks or the quarks or whatever the subatomic particles are spinning off that day. That's what you're going to feel. Now, how come we can change our emotions? Anybody here ever have their emotions change? What happens when, you, when your emotions change? How, what, what causes them to change? What's that? Yell because I can't hear you. Don't yell, what is that? A certain thought. A certain thought. A new thought. Some new evidence. Some new facts. Right? You might like somebody. And you feel, you feel positively towards them. And then they tell you a lie. They lie to you. And your emotions change. You don't like them anymore. You don't like them anymore. Our emotions are products of our evaluations, of our thoughts, of our conclusions, of our reason. But sometimes, sometimes, the conclusions and thoughts that we made a long, long time ago, and we don't even remember making them, and we don't know where they come from. We just feel. We just feel. And sometimes the conclusions we made a long, long time ago that result in our emotions, they might be right. Well, they might be wrong. We don't know. We just feel. Because feelings are neither right or wrong. They just are. But they're not sources of knowledge. All the feeling is telling you is how you feel as a consequence of what you're encountering. It doesn't tell you if that feeling is appropriate or inappropriate, justified or unjustified given the circumstances. You might be afraid of, I don't know, what's good to be afraid of? What? Unemployment? Wow. I didn't expect that. I thought dogs and nukes from North Korea, something like that. Unemployment. Yeah, you might be afraid of unemployment, right? Although, you know, you've got a welfare state in Korea, I'm sure they'll take care of you. Unemployment sucks. But if you're prepared, if you've actually studied, if you've you know, got a good job or if you've got good prospects for a job, why are you afraid of unemployment? What is it that's causing that fear? What do you doubt about yourself or about the world around you that's causing you that? It's not telling you your fear. It's not telling you that you're likely to be unemployed. It's telling you that you think or thought or concluded at some point that you're likely to be unemployed. That might be a right conclusion. It might be a wrong conclusion. The emotion itself is not true or false. But it could be based on wrong conclusions you came to in the past. The point is, emotions are not tools of cognition. They're not based on our reasoning, rational faculty. Because they're based on everything we've thought in the past. Might have been good, might have been bad, we might have reasoned it out, we might not have. We might have used false facts. We might just be being convinced because, I don't know, we're afraid of dogs because a dog barked at us when we were two. And we developed a fear. My, my, my brother, when he was around, yet less than two, crawled into the sea and almost drowned. Right? And for years, he would be afraid of taking a bath. Afraid of taking a bath because he internalized the conclusion, water evil, water scary, water may kill me, don't want water. And then the emotion came, it wasn't he was thinking, he had automatized it. Now as he grew up, he came to new conclusions. Now what is not bad for me, what is fine? And today, like, he swims like in the ocean, miles and miles, he's this amazing swimmer. Right? Because he reprogrammed his emotions, in a sense, by coming to new conclusions. So emotions are not tools of cognition. Indeed, as you get older, you will discover that when you get into trouble in life with other people or just generally it'll be because you followed your emotions you didn't think it through emotions how we get into trouble reason is how we stay out of trouble thinking what I meant saying about being self-interested is think use your mind don't rely on other people to tell you what to think 
independence, the virtue of independence. Think for yourself. Use facts, not emotions. Use logic, the virtue of rationality. Only accept facts. Never delude yourself. Never accept falsehoods into this amazing machinery of logic and reason. Why? Why is lying to yourself so damaging? Well, there's a term in computer science. Those of you who know a little bit about computers. It's called garbage in, garbage out. If you feed a computer garbage, you'll get garbage results. Your brain is the same way. You feed it nonsense, you'll get nonsense. You can't afford to have nonsense. This is the tool for living. It's a tool for surviving. You can't afford to have your brain filled with nonsense. You can't afford to have your brain filled with lies. You can't afford to have your brain filled with half-truths. So lying is really, really bad because it's screwing up with your machinery, with your computer, with your soul, with your mind. You're not going to have good results. Now, it's also pretty bad for lots of other reasons, right? Anybody lie ever? I don't know. Don't know. Like lying, it's like telling somebody else something that's not true. So, so what about white lies? Like somebody's on the verge of dying from cancer, but the doctor, you know, you don't want to tell them they've only got two months to live because, because you know, they'll be depressed and they'll be sad and everything, so you don't want to lie to them. I mean, we can always find borderline cases, right? But I would say, really, if I had two months to live, please tell me. Because I want to do things in my two months, right? If I think I've got a year, I'll behave differently than if I've only got two months. I might want to do all the things on my bucket list. You know the bucket list, the list of things you want to do before you die? Quickly, rather than slowly. And I'll be very disappointed if I die after two months if I'm thinking I'm dying in a year. Honesty almost always is the right policy. There's very few so-called white lies that really make sense. Usually what a white lie is, it's to make ourselves feel, I think, feel better. Because we don't have to confront the person with the truth. We always lie when we lie in order to make ourselves feel better. We pretend that it's for the purpose of helping the other person, but no. It's because we don't want to confront the reality. But reality is all we've got. Reality is where truth is. Reality is where life is. So lying sucks. It's a bad policy. It's not good for you. It's not, you shouldn't lie because it'll hurt other people and we're all altruistic and we're nice. No, don't lie because it'll hurt you. People who lie have rotten lives. They get caught. And if you don't think people care about lying, try it. Try lying to your best friend for a day. Just one day. See what happens. How long they stay your best friend. <laughs> and now project it onto your spouse in the future when you get married. Lying is bad policy for you, for self-interested reasons. It's just not that if you're in business and you lie, you won't stay in business very long. I mean, I don't know of only one profession, really only one profession, where lying actually achieves success. Anybody know what that is? What's that? Bankers? No, bankers, if you lie, you're dead. You're not successful. You can't succeed in banking if you lie. Of all the professions, it's the most, the most crucial. What's that? Acting's not lying. Acting's pretending, which is different. No, there's only one. Politics. Have you ever met a honest politician? I have never met one. I've met lots of politicians. But I've also never met, and, and, and I know that we might be challenges, I've never met, literally never met, and I've met a lot of politicians, Never met a happy politician. Never met a happy politician. They're miserable. Just look at them, you can see it in the, in the photos. <laughs> They're miserable. And it's partially, 
Because they lie all the time. Lying corrupts your own mind. It corrupts your own ability to enjoy life. It's allowing untruths into this precious machine that you have. This precious value which is your mind. Don't do it. It's not good for you. Which means don't go into politics, I guess. Because it seems the politics demands this kind of lying. So here you got three virtues. Just from the idea, follow reason. Be rational. Be an independent thinker. Think for yourself. Independence. Honesty. Honesty. Never lie to yourself. And by extension, don't lie to others because it's destructive. You should live your values. If you believe that you should think before you act, then think before you act. Do what you preach. What's that virtue called? Called integrity. Integrity. Integrity is the idea that you practice what you preach. You live your values. You not just argue for being rational. You don't just argue for being self-interested. You live it. That's being moral. It's living the ideas that you hold as true. It's one of the things that altruism can't do. You can't have integrity and be an altruist. Because you literally cannot live your life living for others. Constantly, all the time. And if you do, you're going to be miserable. Horribly miserable. Just read Mother Teresa's diaries. <laughs> read them. Don't believe me. I don't know if they're in the library, but they're certainly online. She was miserable. She hated life. It was awful. Because she didn't ever live for herself. She never used her mind rationally to think what is truly my long-term self-interest. What is going to make me happy? Because happiness is a vice, not a virtue. If you're an altruist, stop thinking about yourself. Stop thinking about your happiness. You should be thinking about other people. You're wasting precious time. You see, you can't have integrity and altruism. Because integrity would literally demand that every moment of your life you would be thinking about how to help other people. Whenever you find a contradiction like that, you have to challenge the underlying assumption. So, integrity, that's four. Let's see if I remember them all. In order to live, in order to be successful in life, we've got to take the ideas we have in our mind and we've got to live them. And the biggest challenge we have as human beings, we, we don't feel it as much because we're so rich today, but the biggest challenge we have is to feed ourselves. It's to be productive. It's to do the things that are necessary to actually bring about the material values that we need in order to survive, to thrive, and to be successful in life. We have to produce. We have to create. So find that productiveness, the focus on using our minds to figure out how to produce stuff for ourselves, how to have a career, how to do work that you enjoy, but also adds value in the world so that you can make money so that you can use that money to buy the stuff that you need to buy the food, the entertainment the, you know, the things that we buy the transportation, the things that make our life a good life we need money so productiveness the idea of focusing our mind on figuring out how to do that and then doing it acting on it so for Iron Man if you read her books, the heroes are always people who are pursuing a career, whether it's in business, whether it's in architecture, some of them, there's one who's a sculptor, so it could be art, it could be business, it could be music, but all of them take it seriously. All of them try to do it the best that they can do it. All of them are 100% committed to it. They live it. They use their mind to produce values and to, through that, make their life the best. You know, everybody says when you ask them, what's the most important thing in your life? And everybody says, in our culture, I think in career as well, everybody says family. The most important thing in our lives is family, right? So I ask people, why do you spend more time at work than with the family? Because you are. Most of you will spend more time at work than you will with your family. So 
if you look at people's actions, work is more important to them than their family. That's where they spend the energy, that's where they spend the time, that's where they spend the most productive hours of the day. It's at work. Why? To make a living. What's that? So it's the main source that sustains the family, but we just do it for the family? Hopefully not. I mean, there's a number of reasons why we work so hard. One, hopefully, and I encourage you all to think about this, hopefully we love it. Hopefully we love it. Hopefully we have fun at work. I love my work. I hope you love your work. You should get up in the morning saying, yes, I can go work today. Monday morning is a uh, Monday morning is yes. I get to do something exciting today. And if you don't have that kind of job, find one. There's a wonderful speech. I recommend this strongly. Wonderful speech that Steve Jobs made at Stanford University, the commencement address at Stanford University. Go find it's on YouTube. Steve Jobs Stanford. Find it and watch it. It's like ten minutes, but it's one of the best speeches you'll ever hear. And what he says is, find work you love. Find a career you can enjoy. Because you know what? You're going to spend more time at work than anywhere else. You're going to spend more effort at work than anywhere else. By the time you get home to your family, you'll be tired. You better love it. You better enjoy it. You live only once. If you're going to spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day doing something, love it. Just like when you get married, love the person you get married to. Don't just do it out of sense of duty. Don't marry who your parents tell you to marry. Don't marry just on a whim. Figure out who you want to really spend your time with and that you're going to have fun with and that you're going to enjoy. That's who you should marry because you should spend. You know, I've been married 36 years. I mean, imagine if I married somebody you didn't like. That would be torture. <laughs> Luckily, I love my wife even after 36 years. It's pretty cool. It's fun to go home. So, just like you marry somebody you love, find a job, find work, find a career that you love, and take it seriously. Work on it. Because you're not immediately going to love it, right? Some jobs, you have to work into it. I'm not suggesting life is just one long, you know, ecstatic moment. You've got to work to get to the point where you love your job. But have a goal. Work hard at it. Figure it out, but enjoy what you do. And make it challenging. Because part of what happiness requires, part of what being happy requires, is self-esteem. You know what self-esteem is? That's a sense of well-being. It's a sense that I belong on this earth. I'm worthy. I can be successful. I have confidence. I can do stuff. Well, we get that primarily from the work we do. We get that primarily from the job we do. Career we have. And without self-esteem, you cannot attain happiness. And self-esteem is not something other people give you. You know, the schools in America, I don't know about Korea, but the schools in America where everybody gets a ribbon. Everybody gets the same grade. Everybody's treated exactly the same. You don't get self-esteem from that. Everybody pats you on the shoulder, you're great, even when you know you're not. <laughs> because what matters in life is what you know. Not what I know, not what your teachers know, not what the principal knows, not what your parents know. The only thing that matters in life is what you know about yourself. Are you working hard? Are you really trying? Do you cheat once in a while? You know all those things. Right? You know all those things. You're evaluating yourself constantly. And that's the only evaluation that matters. And self-esteem comes from a positive evaluation. Yes, I'm good. Productiveness taking your career seriously, living or, or working in something that you love is so crucial to happiness. Again, you spend most of your time there, you spend most of your energy there, and you get most of your self-esteem from the work that you do. And it's not just about money. Money is just a measure of how much value you create primarily for other people. Because some of us chose to be, che some of us chose to be teachers. Teachers don't make a lot of money. And teachers are pretty smart, usually. They could have gone to make a lot of money, but they chose not to. Because they love teaching. I love this. 
I've literally given up millions of dollars so I can do this. Because love is more important than money. <laughs> Money's pretty cool too, don't get me wrong. And they can often go together, right? Like if you want to be a banker, you can have both, love and money. We can talk about banking if you want. Banking is the most noble of all professions. It is. <laughs> So we got five, right? Rationality, independence, honesty, integrity, productiveness. What am I missing? I yeah, probably don't leave it for the end. Well, I'm missing one before that, right? What else do we have? The rationality and demands. You're going to look it up. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Let's talk about pride. You know, the altruist will tell you never be proud. Pride is a sin. Pride is sin. What is pride? What is pride? You know, I have a called pride the queen of the virtues. The most important of all the virtues is pride. Because pride is the idea, pride is the action that you can be better, that you are going to be as good as you can be. You can be the best that you can be. It's not, hey, look how good I am. That's not pride. Pride is the knowledge that you are seeking moral perfection. You're trying to be the best human being you can be. It's an action. And part of that is recognizing when you do something good. Oh, that was good. I did, I did well there. I gave a guitar. I, you know, I, I built a good machine. I, I got a good grade. That's good. I worked hard. I deserved that. That was good. It's recognizing that. It's acknowledging it. It's how you get that self-esteem. And we're afraid to acknowledge it because we're told that pride is a sin. So don't acknowledge it. But it's more than that because it's a commitment to do better next time. To keep doing well. To be as good as you can be. To live the best life that you can live. To strive to be the best human being you can be. You live once. Once. You want to make the most of it. That's what pride instructs us. That's what pride drives us towards. An important virtue in our man's world. You figure out what the seventh one? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> all of the stuff we've talked about so far, it's interesting, all these virtues, a virtue is about oneself, right? This is self-interest. We talk about morality of self-interest versus a morality of altruism. But we still have to deal with other people. How do you deal with other people? How should you deal with other people? That's the virtue of justice. So what does justice mean? Treat everybody the same? Is that what justice means? That's what a lot of people would like it to, do, to mean these days. The social justice guys want you to treat everybody the same. But does it make sense to treat everybody the same? I mean, altruism tells you, you shouldn't treat everybody the same. The more needy they are, the more you should give them. The more needy they are, the more time you should sacrifice. The more needy somebody is, the more you should focus on them. Need is the standard of how to treat other people. But if you're self-interested, if you're living just for yourself, theoretically, don't care about anybody, how should you treat other people? Screw them, who cares? Walk away. Are other people the value? Are other people something that makes your life better or not? What do you think? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, huh? Yeah, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Justice is the virtue that says figure out who's who. Who you benefit from, who you don't. What do you do with the people who benefit from? Yeah, be nice. Have a relationship with them. What kind of relationship? Ask them to sacrifice for you? Give you stuff? What kind of relationship should we have with people who are going to add to our life? Mutual. Mutual. Mutually beneficial. Ayn Rand called this the trader principle. Now we have 
a state trade in material objects. Like I bought this iPhone for a thousand dollars. Yeah, I bought it there for me. Thousand dollars for the iPhone. How much was it worth to me? How much? Thousand dollars. No, it wasn't worth a thousand. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought it. <laughs> Econ 101. How much? Did, how much? How much is this worth to me? More than a thousand. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bothered. I would have been indifferent. So I bought the iPhone because it's worth a lot more than a thousand dollars to me. It's actually worth. I mean, I've calculated tens of thousands of dollars to me, but don't tell Apple because I don't want them to increase the price. <laughs> so I won when I bought an iPhone. I, I gave up a thousand dollars and got something that's worth more than a thousand to me. Did Apple lose? No. no. Mutually beneficial, trade in principle, win-win. With people who are good to you, with people who are going to benefit you, you want to create win-win relationships. You want to be in a situation where you win and they win. Mutually advantageous. And life generally is about creating as many win-win relationships as you can. Because every time somebody provides you with something, you're better off. And they'll want to keep doing it if you make them better off. Marriage is, if it works, is a win-win relationship. It's a trade. We don't like to think of it as a material, because it's not a material trade, but it's a trade, it's a spiritual trade. Friendship is a trade. If one friend is doing stuff for the other, and the other never does anything, it's not going to work. So, justice demands that we treat good people well. People we get values from, at the very least, we say thank you. Like if I ever met Apple, Apple, Steve Jobs, unfortunately he's dead, I would say thank you. Because I get more value from my iPhone than the money I paid. And the difference is a thank you. And you know what? People like that really appreciate it when you say thank you to them. So when you know somebody's good for you, create some kind of mutually advantageous relationship. Reward them in some little way. That's what justice demands. Treating the good as good. And the good in this case is good for all. We're egoists, right? Good for me. Good for you. You get to decide who's good for you. Treat them well. What about people who are bad for you? How should you treat them? Screw them. Screw them. <laughs> push them away. Keep your distance. You don't have to do anything bad to them. But you don't want to help them. You don't want to sacrifice because helping them is a sacrifice. You don't get anything for it. You get negative value from it. So justice demands that you treat good people well and you treat bad people badly. It means judging people. It means not being neutral. And again, not very PC. We're not supposed to judge people anymore. Everybody's good. Everybody has a goodness in them. No, some people are damn bad. <laughs> and we should treat them that way. I mean, treat them that way means avoiding them, ignoring them, certainly not helping them. Just as the man that you use your mind, you use your reason to figure out who's good for you, who's bad for you, and treat them accordingly. So man has seven virtues. Those are the seven virtues. for you. Making the best life you can for you. Because what's the alternative? It's pretty lousy. Altruism doesn't make sense as a moral system because it can't even be practiced consistently. I can practice egoism consistently. I can be a consistent egoism. I don't have to compromise. I don't have to feel guilty. Because you know, I feel guilty if I do something wrong. That's okay guilt. Bad guilt is unjustified guilt. Unearned guilt. Guilt for something you didn't do. So, I urge you, you're at a great age. This is the age where you start to shape your ideas, trying to figure out what you believe in. Challenging your teachers, challenging your parents, challenging your friends. Reading broadly, you know, the ages between, I'd say, 15, 16 to 25, 26, before you have a family, before you get married, before you have a job, 
and then you get so busy, you don't have time to think big thoughts. Now's the time you can think big. Now's the time that you can attain values that will shape your entire life into the future. What the decisions you make about life now will shape your future now. I'm not talking about which college to go to, who cares? I'm not talking about even what subject you study, who cares? I mean, you're going to live, what, 100, 120, 130 years old? You'll probably have five, six, seven careers. You can't think, I mean, I know you guys are stressing, oh, what university is going to accept me? What should I study? Should it be this or should it be that? Do something. And you won't like it, switch. And you work at it for five years and you don't like that, go back to school and switch again. I've had, I can't remember, five or six careers. And I'm old. Right? You guys, you live in a much more dynamic world where change has gotten even more accelerated than my change in my lifetime. You'll have many careers. So don't obsess about the little stuff. Instead, think about the big stuff. What kind of life do you want? What kind of future do you want? Who do you want to live for? And how do you want to do it? Now is the time. I hope you enjoy the thinking about it. And we will take questions. Thank you.